Hello, everyone. Today we are uh, demonstrating a climate activist panel hosted by NYU Washington DC Dialogues. Today I have assembled uh, three panelists to each talk about their different um, their different act, climate activist groups, what they have accomplished, and what they wish they could. Uh, focus on now during the Biden administration and what the future of the climate activist movement is uh, with this brand new administration. So today our presentation will be called Climate Action or Societal Collapse. And our first speaker will be uh, Hope from Shutdown DC. Hi folks, my name is Hope Nyer. I'm originally from Cincinnati, Ohio, but now I'm a student at American University where I study public health and organize with, among other groups, Shutdown DC. So Shutdown DC is what I'm here to talk to you about today. What we are is a direct action group and a space for groups to come together. So we've been organizing since the fall of 2019 when the youth climate strike put out a call for global strikes and solidarity with them. And we organized Shutdown DC, the first strike that became our name in September on the 23rd. We were supporting the youth climate strike. We worked with uh, friends from the DC groups of both of my fellow panelists, Extinction Rebellion DC, Sunrise DC, as well as groups from across the labor movement and the movement for black lives. We had a really good time, caused a lot of problems um, and drew a lot of attention to the climate crisis. Since then, we've engaged in all sorts of topics, everything from partnering with our friends at La Colectiva, Athena for All, and the For Us Not Amazon Coalition to do a mural outside of Jeff Bezos' Calorama House. We've done an absolutely incredible amount of trainings, a ton of banner drops, and had a really good time talking about what matters to us. A couple things that make Shutdown DC unique. The first thing is that we use a uh, affinity group model and a working group model. So we don't have any particular rules. Roles. You're never going to hear someone say, I am the director of Shutdown DC. And that does a lot of things. It means that we can be more accountable to the groups that we partner with because we're able to make decisions and take action more effectively and more quickly. And it means that nobody has to carry a particular kind of responsibility that they're not willing to take on. I myself work in the communications and training working group, and sometimes that means I'm leading trainings, and sometimes that means I'm tech support, and sometimes that means that I'm doing interviews, and sometimes it means that I'm up at 7.30 in the morning, you know, helping someone get ready for an on-the-way-to-work radio interview. Everyone who's a part of us has a lot of roles. The pictures that I have up here, we have our logo that was created by the amazing Laura Beth Pelner, who is our graphic design genius. She does so much for us. I have our Protect Amazon Workers for Us Not Amazon mural that was part of our Earth Day to May Day event celebrating 50 years of Earth Day last year. I have our Times Up for Fossil Fuels banner, which was actually just dropped yesterday, uh, working with the Build Back Fossil Free Coalition, encouraging Biden to build the country back without the use of fossil fuels. I have our Real People, Real Relief banner from the fall of last year, I believe, could have been earlier this year, that we dropped on a street in DC with a great view of the Capitol building, reminding Congress that they serve real people who need real relief. Down in the bottom left-hand corner, I have, a, I have a picture of our website, which is talking about training, sharing skills, and organizing, which are really the three things that are super important to us. We've worked together and we've found out that we are at our best when we are working on something that takes a long time to plan. So we can, come together and use the consensus process to decide what kind of action we're going to take, when we can share our organizing principles and invite other people into our space, when we can really train hard, build a lot of skills and give people the skills to share them. Uh, we're not really an organization. And I know that sounds weird. It's, it's bizarre for me to come here and say, hi, I'm Hope from Shutdown DC, and then say there is no such thing as Shutdown DC. That's not true. It's the name that we all work under when we come together. But fundamentally, we're not trying to be somebody we're trying to bring something together i've got a list of some events that we've hosted we did shut down dc like i already mentioned supporting the youth climate strike in september of 2019 in december of that year we came together 
with an anti-fossil fuel coalition encouraging banks to divest from fossil fuels to shut down BlackRock in downtown DC. We were planning before the COVID-19 pandemic hit Earth Day to May Day, which was celebrating 50 years of Earth Day last spring, uh, unifying the labor movement and the climate movement. And then, like I said about our Real People Real Relief banners, we've been involved in COVID relief movements. We're also really fortunate to have strong relationships with activists in the Black Lives Matter community here in DC. We've worked with them and the wonderful women behind Harriet's Wildest Dreams all throughout this summer, and we're able to provide a lot of people power and support during their Juneteenth protest and all throughout the summer. In the fall of 2020, <laughs> we worked on the United States presidential election and hosted trainings to deal with what would happen if the election didn't go the way that many of us had our fingers crossed it would. So we worked on scenarios, including people showing up to stop other people from voting. We worked on scenarios, including allegations of widespread election fraud that people actually listened to. And we were able to do that because of the skills that we've gained from months and months and months of organizing other things. That's basically what I have as far as an overview of Shutdown DC. What we're working on right now are disruptive actions throughout the month of May dedicated to stopping the Line 3 pipeline. And I'd invite you to get in touch with us. You can go ahead and check out our Twitter, which is Shutdown DC, our Facebook, which is Strike DC. And if you're local, you can text democracy to 88202. They make fun of me in the movement when I say this, but it's democracy to 88202, like an infomercial. And this QR code here, if you go ahead and scan it, it'll take us to our website. SDDC.co is the short link. We'd invite you to get in touch with us because we do stuff that I think matters and we have a really good time. All right, uh, thank you, Hope. Our next speaker will be Alicia from Sunrise NYC, NYU, NYU, who operates within the Sunrise New York City community. Hi everyone, my name is Alicia and I am the hub coordinator for Sunrise Movement NYU. So Sunrise Movement is a national youth-led organization fighting for climate justice around the country. Um, Sunrise was started in 2017 by a group of young environmentalists who had a big and progressive plan for climate action. Um, Sunrise has hubs all over the country, basically in cities and colleges, and now we're starting to have some high school hubs as well. And this allows us to be able to take action in local settings, as well as have the national organization that works in larger, more national based projects. Um, so Sunrise NYU was restarted in the fall of 2020 after a period of inactivity. Um, and we are unique on campus because Sunrise really addresses the intersection of social and climate justice. So Sunrise Movement members understand that the fight against climate change has to be rooted in marginalized communities. There are many other uh, social justice and environmental justice clubs on campus that we work with, that we have worked with in the past, um, but none of them really have that unique intersection of social and climate justice that Sunrise Movement aims to have. Um, so last semester in the fall of 2020, our big projects were, uh, we were part of the national Get Out the Vote campaign to try to get more voters in the New York City area to register and find out about their polling locations. And we ran that through both in-person and virtual activities throughout downtown Manhattan. And our other focus was to lead protest groups of NYU students to uh, mar marches and protests for progressive policies like defund NYPD, um, the Green New Deal, and other similar causes. So the mission of Sunrise NYU is twofold. One side of it is to connect NYU students to New York City-wide actions for climate and social justice. And the other side is to fight for climate and social justice on campus. So this semester, we've really been focusing on the latter. And we hosted a recent teach-in with YDSA about the NYU 2031 expansion plan. And the NYU 2031 expansion plan was started about 10 years ago by the university. And it involves a lot of 
expansion in New York and Brooklyn. And basically, a lot of students now don't know about it. It's not really talked about much, but it is still very much going on. So we hosted a teach-in to get students to be more educated about the social and environmental impacts of NY 2031. But now, our biggest focus as an organization is our Divest NYU campaign. So this campaign has a long history before Sunrise NYU even started. Um, students at NYU have been fighting for divestment since at least 2013, and there have been several iterations of this campaign since, but it has never been successful. So we are hoping that now with the changing climate and a lot of other universities having divested in recent years, um, that we can make a big, strong push and make a final push for divestment at NYU and be successful this time around. And something unique about our campaign is that we have a much more intersectional approach to divestment. And we're asking not only for NYU to divest from fossil fuels, but also other unethical and irresponsible investments, such as private prisons, which affect the most marginalized members of the country and of our specific community at NYU. We are also asking NYU to make a plan for ethical and responsible investments in the future that includes students and faculty and be more transparent about investments in the future. So as you can see, Sunrise NYU, we have a lot of things going on at once, but we are always grounded in the values of social and climate justice. And we really want to have more students involved, especially next year when we're hoping to be more in person and be able to take more direct action on campus. Um, more members means we can have more effective actions. We can show the NYU administration that we care about social and environmental justice, and we can fight for these values both on campus and throughout the city. So if you're interested in joining Sunrise, or getting involved in any capacity, you can follow at Sunrise Movement NYU on Instagram and DM us to get onboarded onto the org and take up any sort of role you want within it. So that's what I have on Sunrise. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, Alicia. Um, our final panelist here is Mum from Extinction Rebellion New York, and now she's going to detail what Extinction Rebellion's goals and previous uh, accomplishments have been. Thanks, Gabe. Yeah, so um, uh, Extinction Rebellion, uh, we are a global environmental movement um, and we our overarching demand is that we're actually trying to compel government action to avoid tipping points in the climate system, biodiversity loss and the risk of social and ecological collapse. Um, we started in the United Kingdom uh, in May 2018, not very further along. It was started in the United States uh, in December 2018. Um, the first chapter that was actually formed in the United States was actually in New York City. Um, some of the key actions that we had in the beginning was we actually went to the Rockefeller Center and actually did an action on the ice rink. Uh, we've dropped boats on in Times Square uh, and we've done actions in Wall Street um, and so forth. But um, over the course of, I would say, what's this, three years, um, the movement has spread through to over 485 groups globally and we are in more than 70 countries. Um, just to mention, I was actually on a global call today and it was very amazing just hearing from folks from all over the world, especially the global south. Yeah, but in, in all, um, the movement was inspired by obviously like the suffragettes, the Occupy movement, as well as the civil rights movement. And our perspective is that we actually need mass, mass mobilization of mass civil disobedience to actually get the kind of change um, that we actually need um, to, in order to solve the issues that we have at the scale that it needs to be dealt with. Um, Moving on to the next slide, which is around our demands. So one of the reasons why as to why XR has been successful in actually growing globally um, this fast is we actually have very, very simple demands that people can actually be adopting all over the world. So we don't actually get um, involved in policy. We don't actually push for specific bills. 
Um, even if we do as a matter of strategy or tactic, they tend not to be very detailed. They tend to be very simple. Um, and so I'll just go through each one of the demands. The first one is actually just tell the truth. Uh, because right now we feel like gov the government is actually not um, telling the truth about the emergency. Um, and I, the way I say that is because, for example, like Biden um, obviously has just announced that he is having a, um, a new plan to actually get the US to cut carbon emissions by 52% by 2030. Um, the, tr the truth is, is that is actually not aggressive enough as radical as that sounds. Um, and that really is based on the science in the, in the scientific community is that we actually need much more aggressive cuts to our carbon emissions. Uh, the second one is we are asking the government to actually act now, right? So any policy the decisions that they make, we actually, the benchmark that we actually have as a movement is they need to be acting at the degree of actually cutting with the intention of actually cutting emissions by to net zero by 2025. Uh, this is a target that the Green Party has as well. Like I mentioned, it's backed by science. Um, and that's really the, the extent of, of how, how, what we're actually demanding of our government. The third one is beyond politics. So the reason why we say, um, you know, the government needs to act in a way that's beyond politics is because we have seen, and obviously, I'm sure a lot of every, uh, a lot of the attendees uh, right now actually do understand or have observed is there's a lot of political gridlock with the way that the electoral college works today. Um, is politicians get into um, a lot of arguments back and forth, and they may not necessarily be acting in the interest of the public because they may be biased uh, or they may be influenced by corporate lobbying, um, and so in that regard we actually do, XR actually does think that we actually need system change in the, in the way that we actually go through policy making. And the way we do that is what we call a citizens assembly, um, specifically a climate assembly, so that we can actually get, it's, it's, a, it's a form of deliberate democracy where we're not actually just leaving the decision making to our Congress, but we are also saying that um, citizens, everyday citizens, um, similar to a jury process, need to be involved in the decision making. So having a panel um, of experts that can actually share facts, similar to a courtroom, um, and actually explain to the citizens what are the impl different implications of different issues and have different points of views, and actually have the citizens actually vote or decide on how policy needs to be formed. Uh, and I think that's actually very important because, you know, right now we can actually, we are actually in, um, we might have a Biden administration now that is very progressive when it comes to climate, but what happens in three or four years when the government actually, what, there, there is a risk that the parties may change again. And what actually, what actually happens to that is a lot of the progress that we may have in the next three or four years may actually be pulled back again. Um, fourth is, we have uh, a demand around just transition. So um, some, similar to what Alicia was saying is, you know, prioritizing communities that are actually the most vulnerable when it comes to the climate crisis uh, and establishing legal rights for the ecos ecosystem. Um, so from a campaign perspective, um, on to the next slide, sorry, Gabe. Thank you. Um, so from a campaign perspective across the US, we have up to 60 chapters. I would say at this point, there's about maybe 20, 25 really active chapters around the country. Um, we all are decentralized. We all have different campaigns. Uh, we are involved in the Stop Line 3 um, campaign. Um, we are also, also right now, actually, um, we just form a national campaign that we are actually working together to, to push the Biden administration to declare a climate and ecological emergency. And this is a campaign that we're looking to actually build a coalition because it is a very simple demand that I would like to believe that most um, climate groups are actually interested in getting involved in as well. So we are planning on mass mobilizing in the next six months and we hope to um, you know, have as many of you actually join us. And I'll end my presentation there. All right. So I want to thank 
uh, the three panelists, Moon, Hope, and Alicia for presenting on their respective organizations, what they've done and what they hope to do in the future. Uh, now we're gonna be moving on to a Q&A portion. Uh, for the audience members tuning in, uh, you can submit your questions through Zoom using the Q&A tab, uh, which should be on the bottom of your uh, UI. Um, to start off, I will be giving uh, each of them uh, a question, a few questions for them to answer. Uh, you three can, you know, answer them your own way. You can pass them along with each other, discuss with each other, and um, we'll just have a, you know, fireside chat of sorts uh, regarding certain questions regarding uh, climate change policies and uh, direct action. So the first question is, you know, nationwide protests spiked during the Trump administration. Uh, very famously, you had the Women's March that occurred immediately after uh, Trump was uh, inaugurated. Um, so, you know, the Trump administration was sort of defined by, you know, constant protests. You know, last year there was the George Floyd and Black Lives Matter protests that were, you know, reignited over the uh, justifiable grievances of police brutality and uh, systemic racism. Uh, however, now with the Biden administration, it, you know, some people have feared that, you know, now because, you know, the new administration has a D next to their name that, you know, they're going to now just kind of get complacent. They're going to be like, oh, it's okay. You know, the blue guys are in, you know, are in charge now. Everything's going to be, you know, hunky dory. Um, so how can climate activists, climate activist organizations such as Extinction Rebellion, Sunrise, Shutdown DC, how can they hold the Biden administration accountable and keep up the pressure, the severity of the climate change movement? I'm happy to tackle that one. I think that, or at least to start, I think that it doesn't take much to look around and see that people are still holding the Biden administration accountable. That might be something that's more visible um, in DC where it seems like there's a new protest every day. I think just in the last month, um, we've seen, and this is gonna be a very non-exhaustive list, we've seen anti-imperialist protests uh, asking the US to condemn the starvation blockade in Yemen. We've seen a hunger strike from Yemeni activists and youth Palestinian activists. We've seen 350.org and tons of other organizations, including the Climate Clock, delivered a mini Climate Clock from New York to DC by electric car. And we took it from Union Station to deliver to the government by bike. That was a lot of fun. We did that on Wednesday. I also think that the idea that protests spiked during the Trump administ administration is not necessarily inaccurate, but it is perhaps overhyped. I think that sometimes we forget that the Dakota Access Pipeline protest started in 2014, that still the largest climate gathering to this day was the 2014 climate march that was timed to intersect with the UN Climate Summit. Uh, Alicia mentioned fossil fuel divestment. That became, I would argue, a national issue maybe circa 2011. And we were celebrating last year the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. People have been in that fight. And even if people are becoming complacent, it's not the people that have been around, you know, longer than any of us here on screen have been alive. Those people are still fighting. People that I'm really lucky to know include Nadine, Liz, and Patrick, just random names from the Shutdown DC group. Those are Greenpeace activists, 350 activists, anti-pipeline and Teamster activists. We see people who have been in tree sits for years and years and years. And of course, indigenous activists have led us for decades and continue to lead us. I think that what we have to do regarding keeping Biden accountable is going to be to take what we learned over the last four years and then take advantage of the fact that it's a slightly better environment. The evils of the Trump administration that we came out and protested against didn't start with him and they're not gonna end now that he's out of office. Personally, things that I think are important are abolishing the filibuster, passing DC statehood, centering an environmental justice lens. Those kind of things are going to allow us to create a legacy of positive change. We can keep up the pressure and hold accountability to the Biden administration, but we're gonna have to do it to the person after him and the person after that. It doesn't matter who's in office, it matters 
who isn't like that's a cheesy line not a good one but as long as we build power in our communities and focus on a generative future focus on having something to fight for rather than what we're fighting against we're always going to be more powerful and nobody's going to be complacent that's very true and you know i know as the both the two of us are you know very aware of the uh current dc climate you know the dc statehood uh act hr 51 did pass yesterday in the house and you know i think there will be a lot of focus now on you know the filibuster whether or not you know, even something like reconciliation could possibly be used for something like uh, DC statehood. Um, so I do think there are a lot of eyes on Washington uh, regarding Biden and climate. You know, he had his uh, summit yesterday, uh, and you know, we had a lot of world leaders there. Uh, we also had to think Greta Thunberg. Uh, speak with Congress as well. So there was a lot of focus, maybe had something to do with it being Earth Day, but you know, uh, I do think you are absolutely right with uh, your points there. Um, anyone uh, in the panel also interested in tackling that question on uh, how can we keep the Biden administration uh, accountable uh, with when it comes to climate change and other issues? Sure, um, I have another perspective as well. I completely agree with everything Hope said. And I think that um, Trump was a system, a symptom of a larger problem and a symptom of a problem in our system. And that a lot of the things that led to him being in power are still in place and there are things that we have to continue fighting against. At the same time, I really have noticed a decrease in mobilization even within young people after Biden was elected. I think that people were maybe tired of fighting or they see Biden as a solution and it is easier to not remain involved. So what I would say to those types of people is to maybe take this as an opportunity to get more focused in local politics. I think that there is a huge opportunity to make real change in like city and state level politics and organizational movements. And now that it doesn't seem that perhaps the president or the larger federal government is as big of an issue, even though, of course, I, I don't think it's perfect, but maybe it seems a little less pressing now. I think now would be a great time to start educating ourselves more on what is happening locally, getting more involved with community, organi community organizing and with local politics as well. Thank you, uh, Alicia, for that answer. And I do, I do think you're right there. Uh, I think for some people, we see sort of Biden and the Biden administration, you know, despite him sometimes saying that he's going to be the most progressive president ever, that he's just, you know, it's kind of like a, a bandaid over uh, an open wound. Um, and I do think there should be uh, more pressure. Uh, I do know that, you know, even though Biden is you know, postrates himself as, you know, a centrist to an extent, you know, there were definitely victories, I think, for the climate movement. I know Sunrise uh, themselves had uh, lobbied for uh, Deb Holland to uh, become Secretary of the Interior, and she ultimately did. And I think, me personally speaking, you know, that was his best cabinet pick by far. Um, so I do think that uh, we should uh, keep up the pressure, but we should also acknowledge, you know, the victories, no matter how small they are, uh, that we can now achieve uh, with this new administration. So another question that I'm curious to ask is, you know, Biden has this, you know, he had passed the COVID relief bill, uh, and now his next big thing is the uh, American Jobs Plan, and it's a two trillion dollar infrastructure package. Um, and it includes a lot of green energy uh, aspects, initiatives, uh, incentives in them, uh, such as, you know, he wants to allocate, I think, as a hundred around 150 billion uh, investment into electric vehicles. You know, he wants to build a national network, I think, of a half a million electric vehicle chargers. Uh, by 2030, he wants to, you know, electrify school buses. Uh, wants to weatherize, you know, roads, bridges, and buildings, and 
also allocate, I think, 100 billion in just programs to update and modernize electric grids to make them more reliable and less susceptible to blackouts, which I think we're going to go into more detail in uh, one of the other questions I have here. Um, so, and, and also wanting to establish a clean energy standard, uh, which was a plan that's been proposed a lot in the past, but uh, has failed, unfortunately. So, what I'm asking is, uh, what are your thoughts on the contents of the American Jobs Plan, and what else can Biden do to, uh, you know, include maybe future legislation to deal with climate change? You know, uh, I know one of the things Biden's been very stubborn about is the, the whole concept of fracking. Uh, so, just an example to toss out there. Yeah, I, I can go ahead and take this question. Um, I mean, any any traction around or any any bill that the that the Biden administration is pushing that kind of helps you know lead, that is moving to us the path that we need to move is is great. Um, and I do to some extent, I feel like the government and corporations in general are treating. Um, this process as being no different than a economic recovery um, process. And to my, to, to my belief, I, I actually think that jobs um, technology itself, it's not gonna save us, right? There needs to be a much more fundamental change in, in our awareness and actually society itself. So I think the government needs to tell the truth about how bad the crisis is um, and that's by way of educating um, the public, but whether it's through corporations, through schools and all that, but there needs to be a greater awareness because the government can keep pushing bills, but it's not, that's not gonna change consumer behavior. And how we really get out of this crisis is that the individual, not, not to the individual's fault, is society needs to be educated as to why we are talking about biodiversity loss and ecological collapse. Like for example, if the oceans die, we die, right? Right now there's a huge section of, of society that actually just thinks that, you know, climate change is just droughts, floods, fires, but it's much more complex than that. Um, so I think there isn't, I mean, there's, there's tons of things and, and basically everything needs to be overhauled from a legislative perspective. Um, so everything is on the table. And so we need the kind of changes that, you know, how what we saw in World War II or how we saw with COVID, how governments and corporations reacted to um, these crises. We need that kind of response um, for the climate as well. Check. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right, Moon. And uh, I do like that you mentioned sort of having a similar response to World War II. Uh, obviously one of the big, you know, legislative outcomes of World War II was the Green, it was, <laughs> it was the New Deal. And, you know, the Green New Deal is, you know, the, a bill that is sort of passed around a lot in, you know, climate activist groups. And uh, I think there's a lot of misinformation about the bill, unfortunately, but, you know, uh, I think people should definitely understand that, you know, it's called the Green New Deal because not only is it an environmental uh, legislation, but it's also a jobs program. Uh, so I think, you know, tying, you know, a jobs program to uh, environmental legislation uh, would greatly benefit not only our economy, but also, you know, the planet in general. Um, and I do think, you know, corporations do have to also be held accountable. Uh, there's the you know, issue of greenwashing, you know, uh, you know, conveying sort of a false impression or misleading information, you know, about how perhaps a company's products might be, you know, environmentally friendly when in reality they do very minimal uh, impact. Um, any uh, other responses here regarding uh, Biden and the American Jobs Plan and how it relates to climate change? I believe there's a hundred million in the plan that's supposed to address health outcome disparities from pollution and the COVID-19 pandemic, which as a public health student, um, that's something obviously I'm very interested in. I think that future legislation to deal with climate change is also going to have to be aware of social inequities. Uh, the people that are going to suffer first from climate change, both in the US and on a global level, are not the people that are responsible for it. I think that future climate legislation 
in my dream world would be incredibly radical. It would involve provisions for migrants that deal with people who are unable to live in their countries anymore due to climate change. I think it would also include the realization that it's appropriate to deal with climate for climate's sake. I think it's good to tie climate to jobs. I think it's good to tie climate to environmental creation. I think it's good to tie climate to the rest of your party's platform, but you can't run for president when the country's underwater. It's going to become a reality sooner or later. It's going to become a reality for everyone. If not for everyone, then at least for everyone's children. And I think that something that I really resonate with, I think that's a sunrise phrase on the XR um, agenda is the idea of really communicating that urgency and making that urgency an issue that people are able to talk about with the same kind of faculty that we talk about, you know, the topic du jour. Uh, thank you, Hope. And yes, um, I think communicating the urgency is a very important message. You know, yesterday uh, you did have uh, Extinction Rebellion DC, you know, bring out uh, wheelbarrows full of, you know, uh, cow excrement, I think, if I'm going to say this in a more politically correct term, and uh, pour it, you know, near the White House to, you know, uh, show their, you know, thoughts on uh, some of Biden's climate proposals, you know, we, we, always, we always hear these target dates, you know, uh, carbon neutrality by 2030, 2050. And it's, you know, hard to believe that for some people they hear that and they think like, oh, that's a lot of progress. But, you know, when you also look at the data, it feels very minimal. And I think it's because some people do, they don't want to face the reality of just how expensive not only like monetarily but also you know ecologically and you know uh the social cost uh would be for addressing uh the climate crisis the climate issues uh that this country faces and it also faces around the world um it's not always a exclusive part of america you know america is the richest country in the world so it has a lot to it needs to, I suppose, be the leader in this case. That's why they focus so much on the Paris climate. Uh, but I know like in Japan, for example, they have been thinking of pouring out uh, radioactive water from the, I'm probably gonna butcher this, but the, 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 the Fukushima incident. Uh, and I think that should definitely um, bring about um, concern, I think, to climate activists. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, if I could just jump in with some thoughts about the Biden plan. Um, so I think that everyone is already alluding to this, but though the Biden plan is a step in the right direction and is definitely an important improvement from past administrations' um, actions towards climate change, it is definitely too little. Um, I think environmentalists and economists agree that in order to fully transition to renewable energy and avoid the worst consequences of climate change, we need to spend $1 trillion per year for 10 years in order for it to be able to make that transition. And Biden is suggesting spending $2.7 trillion over the course of 10 years. So that's definitely not going to be enough. And I think that Mun referenced um, spending after World War II, which was another big crisis that we faced. And in the last year of World War II, America actually spent 40% of our GDP in one year um, just to on like war recovery. So that would be equivalent in today's dollars to or in today's GDP to $8.5 trillion in 2021 alone. So that just puts into perspective how truly small the Biden plan is. Um, so I think the way to go with this is to see this as a first pillar in a series of legislation against climate change and to build better jobs and to build back the American economy, but using, yeah, like build it back without using fossil fuels and moving towards renewables. So I think that if we see it as that, then it is a great first step towards fighting against climate change, but we really need to focus on passing more progressive legislation like it and not allowing politicians and lobbyists to water down the proposals in, in the plan and to pass it in the strongest way possible. Very true. Um, my final question for you all is on the issue of 
communicating uh, the climate change and climate activism and uh, breaking down disinformation and misinformation. Uh, so as we all know, um, earlier this year, there was a massive winter storm in Texas. Uh, and, you know, millions of people went without power. Um, and, you know, it was just a, a crisis all around. Um, but during that crisis, you had a lot of media outlets, mostly conservative media outlets, just Fox News, um, using the, cri the crisis as a way to blame green energy. They talked about frozen windmills and, you know, things of that manner. How can climate activists and climate activist groups set the record straight and push back against this sort of disinformation from politicians who, you know, they themselves, let's be real here, are likely paid by, you know, the oil lobby and oil barons. Uh, I think on opensecrets.org, um, it shows you that mo the majority of politicians who get the most money in America from the oil lobby are from Texas. Um, so how do we push back against those politicians and those talking points that peddle these lies? Because millions of people, you know, whether or not we want to admit it or not, you know, watch Fox News and, you know, they hear these talking points and then they repeat it to their friends, they repeat it to their family. And so people sort of get this false, you know, idea of what climate uh, change is, what climate activism is, what uh, bills such as the Green New Deal is. I think just yesterday I saw this uh, conservative rep on, on uh, Twitter, you know, talking down on the Green New Deal and he was still parroting these same talking points about planes and cows and, uh, all these things we heard, you know, years ago. Uh, so again, how can we push back against uh, disinformation regarding climate change? Um, and how, and also how can the events in Texas be used as a way to highlight the consequences of climate change? I can go first if um, nobody else wants to. Um, yeah, just so I, I actually looked into the disinformation quite quite a fair bit when Texas um, was having a snow, snowstorm. It was actually one individual that worked, that had connections to uh, the oil industry that actually shared the frozen windmills from a picture of like in Denmark or something like that. And it just permeated throughout the entire social media. The unfortunate thing that for something that like that that happens is, you know, next thing you know, Fox picks up the narrative and then it becomes the topic of conversation at the White House briefings as well too. And then, you know, more centric or more left-wing media has to kind of rebut that instead of actually being able to like talk about the real issues, right? So they become, it becomes like an echo chamber with, within society. Now, what the, what the climate movement can actually do is, um, there, there was actually a fairness doctrine with the federal the FCC was actually regulating the industry. So there was some sort of regulation around um, media in general, uh, but that was actually pulled back during the Reagan administration. And so cable news today is not regulated at all. And I think that is something that the, that the general public actually needs to push for. And it's something that we can start with having a media inquiry or demanding for a media inquiry in, the White, in, um, in DC. Um, and we need to be, you know, asking or asking the government to actually be having some level of oversight over um, broadcast media or cable news um, and also look into media ownership as well, because most of our media are owned by very few people in the world, um, all around the world. Um, and a lot of them have conflict of interest. They have interests in the fossil fuels industry. So I think that needs to be taken out because otherwise, if that conflict of interest exists, we will never be able to actually um, make sure that the public is actually informed of the truth. Check. I think we can borrow from anti-fascist activism here as well. It's really important to talk to people in your communities. I'm not saying get in a fight with grandma, but you know, don't knock her around, you might argue a little. Um, people are gonna listen to the people that they can talk to. If you can combat the stuff that they're taking in by replacing it with a familiar face, someone that they love, that they trust, who's saying, no, actually I do believe these things and, and I'm not scary. Um, 
An example would be, again, from anti-fascist activism, when you combat this idea that like, oh, Antifa rioters are taking up the city by saying, quite literally, no, grandma, I'm an anti-fascist. Your dad who fought in World War II, also an anti-fascist. That kind of thing is an example of building stronger communities. And it's an example of using the relationships you already have. So I think something that's really important is to just post about it, talk about it whenever you can, wear t-shirts with climate change sayings out in public and don't be afraid to get into conversations in the cheese aisle. It's not, nobody has to do everything, but everybody has to do something. That's a really common thing that people say on all sorts of issues, but with just talking about and changing narratives surrounding climate justice and climate activism, I think that's especially important. I also think that a good way just to frame the events in Texas is kind of a not the first time, not the last time situation. My uh, boyfriend is in Sunrise, DC, actually, and he's from Corvallis, Oregon, which has never been burnt by wildfires, but has had them like pushing up on the edge of the town. He's given me permission to share this, that he has really severe asthma and telling his story about how the smoke from the wildfires, even when they're hundreds of miles away from his house, makes it impossible for him to leave his bedroom with towels stuffed under the door. It's something that people really hear that combines disciplines. It takes a personal story and makes it public. So I think storytelling is important uh, and then just talking to people that you know. Very, uh, very good answer there. Um... Yeah, I, I do think that making sort of the consequences of climate change, such as, you know, the storm in Texas and making it more personable rather than just, you know, showing the pictures is, uh, I think, very impactful, especially when it is impacting someone in your family or someone that you love or uh, one of your closest friends. I think it does do a, a great deal of service to uh, demonstrating just how much of an impact it has on uh, people of all different backgrounds. Um, and I know that, you know, for example, environmental racism is a big uh, issue that, you know, I think climate groups uh, discuss a lot. You know, um, you know, we see things such as the uh, Flint water crisis sort of being an example of that, right? Um, so I, I definitely think that by making, uh, by being able to push back on that disinformation by like showing, I think, in a more uh, personable light is a, is a very uh, useful and important tactic that I think everyone should uh, utilize when they can. Um, so any other, uh, any other uh, responses to any of the previous three questions that uh, I gave out, um, you know, pressuring the Biden administration accountability, um, what should we demand for in future legislation, and, uh, you know, how do we combat, you know, climate disinformation, and how do events such as the Texas winter storm uh, demonstrate the consequences of climate change? Okay, so uh, we've gone here for about 15 minutes, and uh, I think we tackled a lot of, we covered a lot of ground here. We talked about, you know, uh, the different, um, the different organizations, the different climate groups, uh, what we should expect now in the Biden administration, uh, how we should be able to try to combat uh, climate disinformation, and how. Uh, the climate movement in general should uh, be focusing on and looking forward in the uh, next two years. Obviously the midterms are a thing that I think we should focus on in regards to uh, climate uh, policy as well as the next four years um, with the next presidential uh, election. So I wanna thank everyone for attending. I wanna thank everyone for participating and uh, to all those who, um, took time out of the day to listen and participate. I thank all of you. And I hope that in the future, uh, it's a much brighter, much greener, and a much more safe uh, future for us, our generation, and hopefully the future generations uh, that we have. So 
thank you all for attending and uh, I hope to uh, get more involved in the climate movement myself once COVID is over. And uh, I hope you can share this with people uh, who you know and hopefully get them involved as well, especially if they are, you know, uh, worried about, you know, uh, the recent surges of storms, hurricanes, wildfires, and the sort in these past couple of years. So thank you all for attending and I hope everyone has a great rest of your day and uh, yeah, thank you all.